Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello and welcome to episode 56. Anyone who knows me and my work will know that I'm crazy about colour and that's why interviewing today's guest was an extra special treat for me. Jane Blundell is recognised as one of the world's experts in colour mixing. Jane has been such an inspiration to people all across the world who visit her website to get lost in the information about colour, different pigments, comparisons of colours from across different watercolour brands, and endless colour mixing inspiration. Jane has collaborated with Daniel Smith to create the Ultimate Mixing Palette. This is a palette of 15 colours carefully chosen by Jane for their ability to create a huge range of beautiful mixes and also to incorporate a range of different watercolour characteristics. So some of the colours are granulating, some are non-granulating, some are staining, some are non-staining, and some are opaque and some are transparent. This is the palette that I use and I absolutely love it. For those who are new to watercolour and not sure what all these watercolour terms mean, I've created a little glossary in the show notes for this episode, which you can refer to if you need to clarify anything. In this conversation with Jane, we chat all about watercolour, colour mixing, how to understand watercolour characteristics, how to develop the skills of water control, and also why watercolour is the best art medium of all. (laughs) Let's listen. Jane, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to chat with you today all about colour and watercolour. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Bethan. So I know that art has been a really big part of your life right from the beginning, and I'd love for you to describe young Jane and her passion for art. Young Jane, well, I was always interested in colour as long as I can remember. So some of the earliest things I used to play around with was playing with um, felt tip pens in all different colours and I used to love putting unusual combinations together, particularly things like aqua and and maroon or just odd colours. When I was seven, I asked for and was given the 72 Derwent pencils. Yes. I still have. I still have those pencils. I've put that in a blog somewhere. Um, I just always loved it and I would would do little studies. I'd play with colour. I did various mucking around with things where I put all these warm colours together and a little bit of cool contrast and playing with acrylics, playing with pencils, playing with pens, anything with colour. And all these always wherever possible working from life. It's something I've always done. So the natural colours were what interested me. But yes, it goes back a very long time. I spent hours in my little studio under the house when I was 11, 12, mucking around with acrylics and then later with watercolour. So um, yeah, it goes way back. Uh, even as a, as a really little child, I used to love very, very bright, well, I still do, bright coloured dresses and um, swirling skirts with lots of colour. So uh, the, the colour Jane goes back a long time. <laughs> I love that. I love that it's part of your life right from the beginning. And, and then you went on and you studied, you studied art, but you studied etching. Is that right? Yes, it seems ironic, doesn't it? Something that's, <laughs> that's generally done in black or, or sepia. But my other love is line. And so I love colour, but I love line. And etching was a way of exploring really, really detailed line work, but then doing multiple prints of it. So I, I did very detailed drawings using, you know, Rotring Isograph pens, which are famous for clogging up super, super fine line. And I could do that incredible detail with an etching. But rather than have it just one, you could then print. And so in a, in a funny sort of way, it's still fitted. So I did detailed etchings, but it was different back then. We were really focusing more on the really fine, the fine printing craft as much as the art. These days, etching is not necessarily done as an addition. It's often done as a whole lot of serial series of mono, monographs or monoprints or monotypes where each one is rolled through a different process or different inks rolled over the top 
when I did it, it was very much black or sepia or brown ink and you could hand color it if you wanted to but generally it was just the purity of the the traditional Rembrandt style etching which I rather loved <laughs> yeah so you've worked in loads of different media but you now you seem to come back all the time to watercolor and I wonder what is it about watercolor that attracts you so much I think it's the purity so of all the mediums that we could work with, watercolour is the purest way to work with pigment because in anything else, it's, it's hidden. So if you have an acrylic binder or an oil binder, you don't really see the characteristics of the pigment. But with watercolour, with nothing holding it onto the paper but the gum arabic, you know, that glue that holds it onto the paper, you're actually able to explore not just the colour but all the characteristics, you know, whether it's opaque, whether it's transparent, whether it granulates or doesn't. You can also explore whether you can lift it off the paper whether you can stain the paper with it and use it as glazing. And so it's the purest way of working with pigment. So if you have an, an interest in pigments, then watercolour en enables you to play with them all. And it's also very simple. You know, it's, it's one of those deceptively simple mediums. Anyone can pick up some watercolours and a brush and some water and throw it around from, the, you know, from a child to a, to a you know, 100 year old. But then there's all the subtleties of, of how to control it because we're trying to control water and control the amount of pigment in it to, to get the effects that you want. So there's there's layers and layers and layers, and I love that as well, but you can, you can learn it and understand it and use it in so many ways and to such a degree of simplicity or complexity. You're right. You can play around with it, but then when you start to look at these characteristics, you can understand that you can harness them for different textures and different effects in your watercolour and that's a really powerful thing isn't it? It certainly is it means that you have to with watercolour you have to plan you really have to think through what you're trying to achieve and then the the order of operation in some ways it's quite mathematical the order of operation in order to get there whether you put a transparent colour over a granulating colour or the other way around whether you um, apply masking fluid or not whether you you know, all, all these sorts of things, how you keep your whites or whether you use a white paint for those who choose to. So there's a lot of planning um, it, or there can be. You can also just do it very intuitively. But if you actually want to get a particular effect, then it takes a bit of planning and then you need to understand the characteristics of the colours you plan to use to be able to best get what you're after. So if you know that you're going to do, for example, a leaf study, then you might want to lift out veins. In that case, you want to choose to use a non-staining pigment or a, if you're mixing greens, non-staining blue and non-staining yellow so that you can lift out the details. But if you want to put layer upon layer over the top of each other, you might choose to use one that is staining so that as you add a layer over the top, it doesn't move what's underneath. So it's that sort of thinking through, how am I going to do this? And therefore, what's the best pigments to use? Yes. And do you think that's why... Some people are scared of watercolour. I've had, I've encountered a, a lot of people who say, oh, I don't even go near it because it's so scary. And I think part of that is because they think that you can't change something that you've put down. But have you encountered people who say that, oh, I'm scared of watercolour, I won't go near it? I, I have. I've actually taught people who've been so scared of, of anything to do with art, to do with, you know, childhood teachers and grade one teachers. They seem to be yes. very nasty that they'll be in tears just at the thought of anything. But no, watercolour is, yes, there are people who are scared of it. And it's, and it's probably because in just about any watercolour set that people get, you know, the, the very basic ones, they nearly always have phthalo blue and phthalo green in them by whatever name. And so they're really powerful and really unnatural and really staining. And so most people, if they've had a go, then they've, they've somehow overloaded their work with these powerful, staining, unnatural colours that they can't get off again. And so you can have a very bad experience right from the start with watercolour if you, you know, if you just use what's in a basic kit. I'd really like to see a fewer of those thalos in a basic kit. I think if we use, um, you know, ultramarine instead of thalo blue and even viridian, actual viridian, but preferably, a, you know, a less, just a less powerful green if you're going to have one. Um, it would just mean people don't get off on the wrong foot. <laughs> Yes, I like that. <laughs> and how would you recommend a beginner or someone who's been doing it for a while but wants to start to deepen their watercolour practice, how, do, how would you help someone get come to grips with all these different uh, qualities of 
pigment characteristics? You have to study each each of the paints that you have. You actually need to try it out to see what it does. Um, with all my courses and any of my students, I'll always the one of the first things I'll always do is have them paint out their palette colours to see how light they can get it and how dark they can get it and whether it will actually be opaque or whether you can lift it off the paper you're using and those sorts of things. So always start by just testing the colours on the paper you're going to use, seeing if you can lift it off again, you know, scrub it back or whatever, so that you actually have your own notes, not just what you might find on a manufacturer's website, which doesn't always apply to every paper, but actually what happens when you apply it. Um, because watercolour can be applied very, very diluted, right up to you know creamy sort of consistency, and it will behave slightly differently at each of those levels. So doing those yourself, I think, is, is really important. So whether it's my in-person workshops or whether it's my online courses, that's one of the very first things I will always do is paint out your palette and get to know it and see the granulation and even compare it on different papers. You know, some people mm. like to work on smooth paper and some on, on medium, some on rough. I always work on medium. But if you work on smooth or rough, you're going to get a different effect again. So it's testing is actually important to doing it yourself and trying it out and actually keeping a record as well. So I'm a real advocate for keeping a, a watercolour notebook where you do record and write. And well, you know this, you've done my course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, keeping a notebook dedicated to colour experiments was one major thing that I loved about your course. And I look at it regularly, I go back to it. It's such a valuable resource and a treasure. Like it's so beautiful, all those colours together. But the fact that you've done it, I mean, while I've done books, so that you can see it, actually doing it, gets it in your head in a whole different level. And then you know where to find that information, you know, whether it's the colour charts or the tests or everything else. And doing it in yourself is, is really important and so helpful. And I, I like it that those books do become something quite precious. I think, I think sketchbooks are an artist's greatest possession. I really think they're the most precious things because that's our, I, I think of it as a playground, but it's also the most personal and the most private if you choose for it to be. But they're really where you can just be free to play. And so I, I value sketchbooks tremendously. And I think that you can't do enough in them. I think they're really, really important. <laughs> but building those sketchbooks, dedicated sketchbooks as a resource is so helpful. And annotating them or indexing or whatever so you can find what you're looking for. It's, it really helps. It really does. I, that's one super valuable tool I learned from you. <laughs> I'd love to talk about pigment numbers and pigments so if a beginner flips over a, a watercolor tube they might see a whole lot of different information and one of the things is pigment numbers and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about pigment numbers about single pigments versus mixes and help beginner listeners sort of get their head around that idea. Mm. Pigment numbers weren't printed on the tubes until about 1993, as far as I know. So when Daniel Smith started producing watercolours in 1993, they printed the uh, pigment numbers on the tubes. And as far as I know, that's the first time okay. that they appeared. Prior to that, it was actually quite hard to know what was in paints because with, that was before the World Wide Web. You know, you couldn't just look things up so easily. And so catalogues and those sorts of things tended to have the information if you could dig around and find it and it maybe it was printed in in the information sheets but actually on a tube you didn't find them and so I think that's something that um, I'm very grateful to, to Daniel Smith for doing that because I think it's others now I think all tubes now do it and I think it's fantastic so the pigment information you usually need your very best glasses to find it it's quite small <laughs> and it's it's kind of confusing but if you if you think about a system each, each um, colour will have a, a letter. So PW is pigment white. PY is pigment yellow. PO is pigment orange. PR is pigment red and so on. And there's blue and green and violet and brown and black. Brown is B, capital B, small r. And black is capital B, small k. So there'll be that first letter which tells you whether it's a white or a red or a blue. And then there's a number after that. Now, I didn't design this system. and Whoever did had a, had a logic that I have never managed to work out. Okay. I mean, logically, I would have thought the most ancient pigments, things like yellow ochre and, and Indian red, you know, red oxide, would have been PY 
one and PR one, but no, they're not. So those Indian reds, those earth pigments, it's PR 101. Okay. Um, and, and yellow ochre, you know, ancient kind of color is PY43. So the logic of it, I don't know. So I, I, can't, understand, I can't explain why the numbers were chosen. However, the higher numbers, if you see a PR264, they are more recent. So they, they're kind of, you know, last century time of okay. colors as a general rule. Um, so the the, the modern um, quinacridones and the pyrroles and the perilines and those sorts of things that have come out since the 1950s tend to have you know slightly higher numbers. Um, so what you've got to look for is understand which pigments are, are, are going to do certain things. For example, I mentioned phthalo blue. Um, phthalo blue is is PB15, but then sometimes after that there'll be a colon. So PB15 15, 15, colon three indicates phthalo blue green shade, which is what we're very familiar with. It's a slightly turquoisey blue. If it was PB15 colon six, it's the red shade, which is slightly warmer. It's um, almost like an ultramarine, but a very staining one. So if you wanted a non-granulating staining ultramarine kind of color, you might get phthalo blue red shade. You can also sometimes see PB15 colon one, and that's another version of red shade. When you're looking at tubes of colours and you see a number of those pigment numbers listed, it means it's a mix. So you might see a colour called cerulean and it will have PB15 colon 3, PW4 or PW6, which means it's not actually cerulean, it's phthalo blue and white. If you wanted it to be really cerulean, it's either going to be PB35 or PB36. For cerulean chromium. So those numbers are really, really important, uh, particularly if you want to use the pure original pigments, the genuine colour, rather than a hue. And there's no, there's no real rule about what a, a colour is called. So if a manufacturer chooses to, to call a colour cerulean but use a hue, they don't have to call it cerulean hue. Okay. It doesn't help, which is why these pigments are so, the numbers are so important. So if you want to know you're working with a, a genuine cerulean, which is a, an expensive pigment, or a genuine cobalt blue, which is another expensive pigment, it's PB28, or a genuine single pigment colour, those numbers are really, really helpful. They also help you to know, for example, there's a lot of mixed greens, and I, I use mixed greens, but I use the ones that have the pigments I'm already working with, because then they're going to be harmonious with what I'm using, but they're just convenient because you've got a starting point. So, for example, in Daniel Smith, there's a, a sap green, which is made with quinacridone gold and phthalo green. And it's a beautiful, very useful green. So in the pigment numbers for that, you would see the phthalo green listed as PG7, and the quinacridone gold will be listed as a mixture of PY150 and PO48. So you have these three pigments, and you know what they are, and you know how they fit with the rest of the colours. But you also know that you, if you have those pigments, the quinacridone gold and the phthalo green, you can actually make that colour yourself in your palette. So you don't have to have it as a convenience mix unless you choose to. So once again, it gives you the power of understanding those pigment numbers. But it is a bit daunting. Um, and this is why I sort of suggested a, a 15 colour palette that people begin with, though, so that you sort of start with colours and intermix them and just add to those, you know, where you really want that convenience. So if you're working with the, the 15 colour palette, it doesn't have a purple. You can mix all sorts of beautiful purples with it. But if you're a purple person, you might think, well, I know that the Daniel Smith Imperial Purple has um, quinacridone rose and ultramarine. I've got those in the palette. I could add that to the palette and it's going to tie in. Or you might think, actually, I wanted to get one that's not granulating and that's really more powerful. I'll go with um, a PV23, which is... a Carbazole violet or dioxazine violet is its general name. And that one's still going to fit in, but it's going to be a staining and non-granulating version. So you sort of can start with something that makes it easy to understand, and then you can add others as you wish. Because it is daunting. I mean, it really is. And a lot of student colours don't even show what pigments are in them. It's a bit harder to find, as well as being harder to work with. I'm not really a fan of student palettes <laughs> go with the, the artist range and use the proper pigments and 
really understand what watercolor is, is is what I would always suggest. <laughs> yeah, it is a little daunting, but when you get to know it, there is a whole lot of power behind knowing that. And also, like you say, being able to bring in convenience colors that are harmonious. It's a really wonderful thing to understand, mm -hmm. even though it takes just just take little steps towards it. And the understanding comes over time with playing with, with the colors in the sketchbook, doesn't it? That's right. Yes. And that's, it's once again, where you actually try them out. Um, so just see what happens. I, I love that sense of play and because it's such a easy and such a easy to clean up, you know, you, yes. you're, not, you're not dealing with, I mean, you're not dealing with all the difficulties that you are with acrylics or oils. And while the tubes of paint are expensive to buy, they last you for a very long time because you can re-wet and re-wet and re-wet. And as you know, I always work with dry colour. So I squeeze it into the palette and let it dry. And then just you're just activating it, reactivating over and over again. So it's it's incredibly easy to just start, do something quick and then, you know, put it away again or leave it out or whatever. It's just so easy. Whereas, you know, with oil paints, you have to put them all out. You've got to either have some sort of stay wet palette or or another way of dealing with it, which is just very difficult. I and mean, this is why I took I went back to watercolour when my children were little, because Etching was just not safe. I couldn't have acids and all these sorts of rounds. And we'd also moved to the other side of the world, so I couldn't take anything with me. Watercolour was portable. And I love working on location. So once again, watercolour is portable. So I think of it as being, you know, very friendly and very sociable and very portable and very easy to just set up and, and, and fairly non-toxic. I mean, you know, I don't drink my, drink my painting. But if I did, it's not going to kill me. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just a very, um, very, very easy um, medium to, to just play and of course you can use it to prepare studies and try things out in a sketchbook so easily as well so uh, you know it's the queen of materials for good reason I'm with you I started watercolor when I was 14 and I didn't know a lot about it for years and years and years certainly didn't know a lot about color and I did a lot of art with watercolor sort of intuitively, like bringing in colours just as I felt. And then I came up to a point where I was really frustrated that I couldn't get the colours that I wanted. I didn't know what was behind it. And that was when I went on this deliberate journey of like exploring colour and learning the theory. And that's when I came to your uh, Mastering Watercolours course, which was a huge eye-opener for me for so many reasons, but it really helped me come to terms with all the color stuff and now I feel like there's enormous freedom in knowing just that little bit extra about the theory yes yeah it, it really is and, and I think that's really important that that knowledge that you now have gives you the freedom to explore because you you're not going to be so scared of it um, exactly I was yeah when I started watercolor too really <laughs> yeah I, I used to go past on my way to school I'd go past this little store and it had a, a little set of it was a Windsor and Newton Cotland palette I'm pretty sure and, um, and I went past it and eventually I bought it and took it home and just started playing with it. And I just felt as though I'd come home. It was a, like a language I already understood. Um, I haven't, I've never had a lesson in watercolour, so I'm self-taught. But um, I've taught myself by, by exploring and trying things and mixing every colour with every colour and, and lifting and scrubbing. And I've got, you know, all these um, notebooks and, and sketchbooks full of all these sorts of mixes and experiments and and reading, you know, I've read books and looked at things and so on. But uh, I've, I've done it all by, by playing with it and exploring it quite deliberately. So I don't know if you've noticed my, seen my book, um, Watercolour Mixing Charts, but it's just full of every colour mixed with every colour to see what happens. And when I was doing all that, sometimes I just was so surprised. I mean, I did a fine arts degree, but I wasn't taught about colour there. I, mm. So sometimes I'd still come across something and just think, I mean, the first time I mixed a, um, a crimson with a with a phthalo green and got black and I just went wow <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah of course that makes sense but it really did and and all the other colors that were just so ah that's how you'd make that so I tried to come up with a way of any color I could think of I could find two colors I could mix or else I'd, I'd set up a challenge and I think right I'd, I'd look at something around the room and see some color and see how many ways I could make it with all different combinations. It's just a game. I see yes. it all the time. I look at a scene and I think, yeah, this pigment, this pigment, this pigment, or this and this and this. So, and it's just always going on. You can't help it. Trust my I, <laughs> Yeah, I started doing that too. Like I'll look at the sky and think, oh, a little bit of ultramarine, oh, a little bit of cerulean. You know, just you just start thinking in terms of that. 
mixing in your mind. Yes. And those two work so well because you can lift out the clouds. (laughs) Well, speaking about that, so you can see my clouds behind me and this year for the Wild Wonder uh, Nature Journaling Conference, I did a watercolour clouds class and it just took off. There's now a group and we call ourselves the Sky Scapito Appreciation Society and I would love to, I think I, I, it would be remiss of me not to ask you about your favourite colours for painting skies. Well, I generally will start with cerulean and ultramarine. And it's okay. kind of interesting because, you know, I talk about working with triads and so suddenly, immediately, I've got a cool blue and a wall blue. But often the colour of the sky is just to one side of, of, a, of a mid-blue or the other. And, and often you could, you could do it with a cobalt, which is really a mid-blue. But I find that that combination of ultramarine and cerulean gives you the ability to sort of skew it towards the green or skew it towards the purple. Um, add more water or less water and add a bit of Jane's Grey if necessary. And that will generally work for anywhere in the world. It's really quite interesting. That combination of cerulean blue and um, ultramarine. And I use cerulean chromium, which is a bit more green than a general, than, a, than just the cerulean. But the Jane's Grey can be really helpful too. I mean, that you could just add a little bit of burnt sienna, but it can get a bit dirty. So I do actually like to add it as a, as a mixed grey. I'm just adding more ultramarine, of course. But that combination works beautifully. Sometimes in Australia, when we get those almost purple skies, yes. I'll add in quinacridone rose because it can be really quite incredible. And if it's incredibly strong, I've actually done a sky in indanthrone blue, which is also beautiful at night, you know, really build up mm. and just have an almost black sky, but do it with indanthrone blue. But generally speaking, cerulean and ultramarine are just perfect all over the world, whether it's a bright day, whether it's a dull day, whether it's um, a bit of grey in it or not and then of course lifting out the clouds with a bit of paper towel and a damp paper just works really really well if you then need to work into the clouds to get a little bit of solidity to them make them into thunder clouds or whatever I let it dry and then re-dampen those and then put the grey and, and a bit of blue into those some people put uh, raw sienna into the clouds and I think in England you do get a slightly different look there's a bit of yellow in them I haven't okay. noticed that personally but I have seen it, and so that's another thing that I know some people do. But, uh, yeah, basically ultramarine and cerulean chromium work beautifully. Both granulating, but I don't mind that. You know, mm. I'd rather be able to lift out the clouds and have that granulation than, than not. But also, as I said, cobalt blue is another colour that many people use, and it's beautiful, but that's a mid-blue right from the start, and you'd probably still have to adjust it one way or another, and it's much more expensive to throw it around. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I use uh, manganese blue hue with ultramarine for for the sky mix. I, I like you that. Used mix. manganese genuine? No. Hard to get hold of. It's um because it's liftable, uh, very granulating and very liftable. Um, but it's you know manganese hue is usually made with a phthalo and it can be quite staining. Okay. Uh, so usually manganese hue is phthalo blue and white, but. Um, yeah, the actual genuine, genuine one is, is very, very beautiful, um, incredible granulation. I bought it to do snow because I had read somewhere that it's perfect for snow, but it's not good for snow in Australia. It's the wrong colour. So the shadow of, of in snow in Australia is, is ultramarine. You see this blue, but it's, it's an ultramarine blue. But apparently the shadow of snow in Europe is more is um, manganese and it's perfect because it granulates beautifully. But uh, I've never used it, for, <laughs> never ended up using it for snow. Wow. Is that because of the quality of the light here yeah. or the surroundings? Interesting. Yeah, the quality of the light. When, and it's amazing if you've been to Europe and you come back to Australia and walk outside you know, at the airport and suddenly that it's not just the intensity of the light that strikes me, it's the intensity of the shadows really dark because the light is so really really strong and so yeah that intensity um and, the, and maybe the color of the light uh it's quite fascinating i was once in in greece and i looked across at a wall and there was an absolutely cobalt blue shadow on the wall wow. so the shadow of a chair was cobalt blue which meant the light must have been incredibly orange because that's the opposite and it was just beautiful i just i, I looked at my husband and i said <laughs> and he, you know, he rolled his eyes as usual <laughs> Um, but they actually kind of went, yeah, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, wow, that's fascinating. Oh, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about um, Australian colours. I did another class last year for the Wild Wonder Conference and it was called Colours of Australia. And so I talked about 
having really bright brights because we have some really fascinating bright colours here like the rainbow lorikeet and wattle and all those. And then I talked about those beautiful muted uh, greens and ochres and reds that we have here as well. And I wanted to ask you about painting Australian colours, what you love and what your experience is of this unique Mm. colour palette that we have here. Mm. Well, one of the triads I use is, I call it the Aussie triad, because it works so well for our gum trees and so on. So it's quinacridone gold and uh, pyrrole crimson and ultramarine. So it's a it's a lovely, warm, slightly neutralised warm yellow that mixes the most beautiful greens with ultramarine. Now, they, they, you can't get a bright green with those, so you couldn't do the lorikeets with it, but you can get all those gorgeous foliage greens and gum dream, greens and so on. And then the crimson and the, and the quinacridone gold will also mix amazing rich oranges and reds and so on but not quite as bright and then of course you can make all the, the lovely darks um so it's it's not a it's not a triad i'd use for really bright colors but it's lovely for foliage colors and landscape colors and those sorts of things if i want to go into the the bright ones the lorikeet ones then i'd probably go with an absolute cool bright palette you know i'd use hansi yellow medium and quinacridone rose and phthalo blue because and, and add in phthalo green as well, but that would give you all those colours for all those super bright um, bright ones as well. So obviously you could then have um, uh, the Hansi yellow and the Quinacridone gold as your two two yellows, and the pyrrole crimson and the pyro and the Quinacridone rose. Did I say gold or rose before? Anyway, um, which are both cool um, for the reds. So I'd attribute two cool reds. And then um, the phthalo blue and the ultramarine for the blues. And that would be a very, very workable palette. Kind of unusual not to have a warm red, but you can create a warm red by adding either of, mixing either of those with the yellows and create warm reds and pictures. So it actually makes it very, very workable. So I actually would work with, you know, all of those painting Australia, um, just choosing which was needed for whatever the subject was. I think they use the same combination just about anywhere in the world. So mm. it's not only Australia, but yes, they have very different mixes for those different subjects. So it is a, a big colour range. But that that combination of quinacridone gold and, and ultramarine is just wonderful for the Australian bush. I love our colours. And when I was musing on, when I was preparing for that class, I was, I had my eyes wide open to the colours of Australia and the colours of our eucalypt leaves and just the earth and the brown grass in summertime. I just, mm. it's. It's very different. Yeah. I was taking a <laughs> workshop in America and as I was driving from, you know, I was on the West Coast and as I was driving from South to North, I was looking out in California and, and it was all the very earth palette colours, you know, sort of yellow ochre, Indian red, cerulean kind of colours. And as I was driving further South, it worked, you know, it changed into the more Aussie triad, you know, the, the quinacridone gold and, crimson and and um and ultramarine and then as i went further again it got into a, a richer and deeper palette again and it was just fascinating just the way wow. you know as i'd be looking i think yeah you'd use those three for this and now you'd use these three and now you <laughs> i love that you you've got like these color mixing goggles on it yes <laughs> <laughs> how would someone go about like choosing colors for their specific landscape how would you how would you advise someone in one particular place to get to know a palette that would work for their place? Um, well, I'd still, I would still start with my ultimate mixing palette because it can be yeah. used anywhere. Um, it, it really, I, I use those colours anywhere in the world and I've travelled quite a lot. Um, there might be colours you would add in a particular place. So in the Greek islands, I would probably add cobalt blue just because you've got those beautiful rooftops. And yes, you can mix a cobalt blue hue with ultramarine and cerulean, but you might add cobalt blue. Or you might add um, quinacridone lilac or um, quinacridone magenta, depending on the brand you're using, but made with PR122. So that absolute magenta colour if you want to get bougainvillea. Because while we can get very, very close with quinacridone rose, it doesn't <laughs> quite get it. So that would be one you might add in those circumstances. There are other places, if you were actually in the in a tropical island or something, you might add cobalt turquoise, you know, the, the little little brother of yes. the of cerulean made with PB36 absolutely beautiful granulating turquoise colour. They still tie in with the other colours that, I mean, you can mix a hue of them, but those are colours that, you know, you might add in that sort of in that sort of circumstance. And as I said, if you love purples or you love oranges, you know, you might add others as well. 
but that, I mean, I did a lot of testing of colours when I was creating that palette, trying to think, you know, and I started off trying to do it with just 12 and I could, okay. you know, I really felt, no, you need that, the, the, the 15 to really get there because I can't live without my buff titanium and I love the James Gray as convenience colours as well. So, you know, with those colours, you can actually paint anywhere, but the, the, the sort of personal colours you might add or the convenience colours, I think, you know, generally speaking, you want to end up with probably 20 personal colours, you know, in total. So you have the ultimate mix and set and another five that you love for whatever reason. Or you might go up to 25, but I generally suggest people just don't keep on building and building and building, you know, have have a basic set, have some fun extras that you want to play with, but keep them separate and get to know your basic 20 or 24 or whatever really well. And, and then, you know, only bring in others when you need it. And that way you don't get overwhelmed. You get to know those colours really, really well, understand how the extra ones fit in, and then you can sort of paint everything without having to worry. I think a lot of people end up with 60 colours. Oh, where do I start? What do I do? And it's, and it's overwhelming. It's tempting. Yes. Uh, it's certainly tempting. But I, you know, just controlling it is really helpful. So when I do a palette consultation with people, what I'll generally do is say, right, well, we're going to aim for 16 or 20 or 24 as a basic palette. And get that set up and, you know, based on what they want to paint and, and get it all in order. And then I'll suggest, okay, now test out the other colours, see how they fit in with that. And they may end up with another set of 10 or, or, or it might be more than that but just make them up in full pans, stick them in a box and just pull one out and do something with it. But don't be overwhelmed with it. And I think that can really help people as well because people get overwhelmed. And I think yes. you see these sets of 48 or whatever. It's one thing in pencils because they're hard. I mean, yes, you can overblend them, but, you know, pencils, yes. I had my 72. I've got a set of 120 Faber-Castell Abertura. <laughs> I love them. But, you know, generally I would work with, you know, a smaller number of them, but sometimes you just do that. It's the same with pastels. People, mm. people pastel artists have thousands of colour, hundreds of colours. But with watercolour, because of the ability to mix it, um, I think stopping being overwhelmed and getting good quality paints and, sm and fewer number just really, really helps. Yes, that's great advice. I think the temptation to go and buy every colour that you think you need is um, something that I had a tendency towards before I knew the color theory. And then when you know the color theory, you understand that you don't, you just don't need that, all those colors. Well, you learn how to mix them. So you sort of, you might think, okay, I really love, I mean, it might be Caroline Maroon for some, for example, it's a, a wonderful, rich, 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 deep red or deep maroon color, but you know how to mix it. So you just think, well, okay, I don't need that much. Um, so if you know how to mix it, it just simplifies it and, and it makes it easier. But as I said, if it's something that you love, well, by all means, add it if you want to. It's not yeah. the idea, isn't that it's a. And I don't like anything to be a limit. I mean, even a trident isn't intended as a limit. It's a guide. It's a starting point. So you know, if you if you um, as you'll know, if you if you have a triad of colours and you can mix another colour using those triad colours, then you can add that in which is why you can work with um, the triad I mentioned before of, of Hansi Yellow Medium and Quinacridone Rose and Ultramarine because you can actually make a very bright red by mixing strong um, Quinacridone Rose with the Hansi Yellow Medium. You could actually add pyrrole scarlet into it. So you're having in the triad a warm red and a cool red. Now that sort of sounds like a contradiction, but they're not going to fight. They're all going to you know work nicely together. So if you can mix it, you can add it. So it means that you, you're starting with a guide, but you're not, um, but you're not limited by it, and it and it makes sense if you actually put it into practice. But in the same triad, if you have your ultramarine and the hands yellow medium, you wouldn't add phthalo green because you can't mix that bright green and it's going to look weird, unless you were going to dull it right down, you know, sort of use it very neutralised. But if you use it as is, it's just going to stand out and look dreadful. Um, it looks. I think phthalo green generally is what will make an amateur painting look amateur if it's not mixed with something. It's, you know, it's one rule I have with watercolour. If you're going to use phthalo green, which I do, always mix it with something and then it can be your friend and not your enemy. So That's it's interesting. Fun, but it's a mixing colour. <laughs> yeah, so looking at my palette, my um, ultimate mixing palette that I have, the phthalo green is the one that I haven't used and I guess it's because I have used it occasionally but I rarely use it and... I guess that's because I don't yet understand it's full power as a mixing colour and it's not something that you would use um, straight 
straight from the pan. So I wonder if you could talk about that particular colour and what power it has as a mixing colour. Yes, as a mixing colour, it's wonderful. So if you mix phthalo green with a, a, a mid or bright yellow, hence yellow medium, just think of it as a primary mid yellow. What do you think of when you think yellow? Um, you mix it with that and you'll get those frog greens, you know, bright, those gorgeous little tiny little frogs, really, really <laughs> bright and vibrant. Um but not necessarily realistic or very, very new growth, particularly in Europe, new mm. growth, that sort of colour. If instead of mixing it with the, um, the mid-yellow, you mix it with a quinacridone gold, so a warm yellow, then you start to create much more, um, it's still the new growth colour, but it's, it's a little bit more realistic. It doesn't look super bright, not the frog green, it's now getting into lovely fresh spring green. Um, so just mixed in with either of the yellows, you're creating greens. But if, they, if they're still too bright, you only need to add a tiny, tiny bit of crimson, tiny bit, or a tiny bit of burnt sienna, and that will knock them back. It'll start to reduce them slightly and make them a little bit more olive. Thalo green mixed with thalo blue makes thalo turquoise. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful turquoise colours. And you can water it right down to become an aqua. And if you use a little bit more of the blue, it's obviously going to be a bluer turquoise or more of the, the green, it'll make it more of a greeny turquoise. So they're beautiful for all those Caribbean sort of colours. Thalo green mixed with pyrrol crimson gives you an extraordinary range of colours. It's one of the most incredible mixing pairs because as you start to add a tiny bit of crimson into the thalo green, it darkens it into a gorgeous perylene green hue, which is the like shadow colour in foliage. And if you keep on adding a little bit more, a little bit more thalo, um, thalo crimson into the thalo, sorry, pyrrol crimson into the thalo green, you eventually reach black. And then if you keep on adding the crimson, you start to go through all these beautiful perylene maroon and, um, and general sort of fig colours and grape colours and aubergine colours and so on. So that mixing pair is wonderful. You need to play with that. Nice. It's less than six, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's really extraordinary what it can do. Now, if you mix thalo green with quinacridone rose, you get these incredible purple colours. So quinacridone rose is so good at making purples not only will it make a purple with any of the blues, but also with thalo green. With the green, And then there's wow. sorts of colours that you see in orchids and they're really unusual. You could almost mix a blue. You're not supposed to be able to mix a blue, but with thalo green and quinacridone rose, you just about mix a blue. Certainly a grey, but it's a bluey grey. So mixing thalo green with your earth colours gives you another range. So you try it with the goethite and it makes these beautiful earthy greens. You try it with burnt sienna. And you get these really nice pine greens and try it with Indian red and you get even darker pine greens. Mix it with raw umber, which is a type of yellow, and you get really deep earthy greens. So it is extraordinary. I've done a blog post just on mixing okay. thalo green and I've done this uh, circular thing, mixing it with everything, just sort of with thalo green in the middle and then everything radiates out and you want to have a look because it's... Oh, I'm going to play. I'm going to play after this. <laughs> Just a little, you know, it's so powerful. You don't yeah. use a lot, except when you're mixing it with the pyrrol crimson, then you actually go strong and you can make black. So that mixture of pyrrol crimson and phthalo green in strong, um, I call it Jane's black. It's a beautiful, absolutely neutral, staining, strong, non-granulating black um, and really, really useful colour. I mix that from the tube and create you know, a whole pan of, of Jane's black. And it's uh, it's great when you really want a black, but you don't want to use black pigments, as you know. Yes. Black pigments. Yeah. Ooh, how exciting. Thank you. <laughs> your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm interested to ask you your thoughts on why we are taught as kids red, blue and yellow are the primary colours because that's so complicated and there's this issue where when you're mixing a fire engine red with a, a blue, you you mix black almost or you mix a muddy brown and I'm wondering about that why we are taught this and because you can also you know we they say um these are the primary colors because you can't mix them but you can mix a fire engine red with a, a yellow and a, a magenta what's going on why are we being taught this <laughs> yes so I think it depends how you define red and okay. you know red has many it's quite a big range. I mean, they all have a big range, but I think red is the most important. So, you know, blue we're familiar with and yellow we're familiar with. And, and they're, you know, you can you can work with those. The closer your yellow is to green and the closer your blue is to green, 
the brighter it's going to be. Now it happens that in children's paints, phthalo blue is a cheap pigment. So the blue that they'll tend to use tends to be a phthalo blue, I believe. And the yellow is a fairly standard yellow. So they'll be able to mix greens very easily. The red is the tricky one um, because what we actually want is a rose red. Now, I don't, I know that there is this other, other way of looking at it, that we have magenta, cyan and, um, and yellow. The problem is we can make a magenta, so that's not primary either. It's actually rose is the colour that you need to start with. Okay. So if at school, instead of um, a scarlet red, they had a rose red, then our yellow, red and blue would be a primary. So in what a colour, the closest we can get to that cyan, magenta, yellow would be um, something like um, transparent, oh, what's it called? The transparent yellow pigment, one um, PY1550, which is known as nickel azo yellow in, in, in um, Daniel Smith, or the Hansi yellow medium, and they're great examples of really good mid yellow. And then the colour I mentioned before, so quinacridone magenta, or in Daniel Smith it's quinacridone lilac, made with PR122, that's the closest there is to magenta. And then you'd probably use um, the phthalo blue, um, 15 colon 3, so the green shade. That's about as close as we can get. But that magenta is tricky because, yes, you can still mix it with the yellow to make a red, but you can't mix it with yellow to make rose. So rose becomes the one that you can't mix. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the best um, watercolour triad to make every colour you might want would be hands yellow medium type colour quinacridone rose and then it's a choice I use ultramarine but in fact phthalo blue green shade would be the more you know the more um versatile one because that would give you the brightest greens but I just prefer to use ultramarine because it's not a staining so it's it's a tricky one and, and as I say the yellows and the blues are okay it's the red that's the problem and even if they had two reds they had a scarlet red and a rose red or even a crimson red that solves it but uh, it's the rose red that's so important. That's that's how you get those purples. So rose, quinacridone rose mixed with any blue will make purple. And as I say, even with um, phthalo green. And you can create the reds by mixing the rose through the other way. So it's it's that's the problem one. And and yes, we've all done it. You mix, you yes. mix the red, you mix the blue, you get brick, really useful colours, you know. <laughs> Not blue. what we were going for. <laughs> well, yeah, you get brick, you get indigo, you get black, you get all these things, but you don't get purple. Yeah. It needs to be a rose red and then it, then you'll get the purple. I remember watching play school with my son and they were talking about colours. Yeah, we're going to mix colours with the kids and the the girl on play school, she she put in some blue and it was, again, those acrylic paints that are standard in childhood and, you know, I think it's probably phthalo blue and some sort of fire engine red and she mixed them together and she's, she's confused and she's getting brown and she's... Um, saying oh just it's not quite purple I'm just going to add a bit more red and I was you know <laughs> I was watching going oh no it's not going to work because you've chosen these colors well I was doing some set painting at a primary school when my my kids were there and I actually had them order a crimson uh, yes. because they only had a red and I said look you can't make purple with this color so they actually ordered this great big you know two gallon <laughs> liter thing of of a, of a crimsony red so that we can make the purples that we needed for the background but now, this was, this was, you know, year six, they ought to know about colour, but um, they had the other colours, but they just didn't have this one. So, yes, we found this this crimson red in the range. I don't think there was a quinacridone gold, a quinacridone rose type red, but there was a crimson. So we could do the purples and, and obviously you could add white and do all sorts of things and make all the purples that we needed for whatever it was we were doing. But, yes, it's, it is this, I mean, the split primary system is really what we paint with a lot. Um, and, and, you know, while you can do, you know, a huge amount with just three colours. Generally, we are looking at having more than those. But uh, if you start with a rose instead of a, instead of anything else, you know, that's going to be your primary red. Yes. I'm interested to talk about colour families. So people might hear these names like quinacridone and perylene. Um, what else do we have? Pyrol. Pyrol. Yeah, exactly. When you hear these names, is it naming similar pigments, similar characteristics, what puts a pigment in a family like that? Well, they're their chemical names. Okay. So all of the quinacridones have the same atomic structure. Quin is okay. five. So there's five atoms, you know, in, in them. So, and there's just a slightly different way that they're bonded that creates the different colours. 
so the perilines have a different atomic structure and the and the pi and the and the pyrals another one so they'll share characteristics um, so there's so the quinacridone colors are all uh, man-made um, they were largely made like many for the, the car industry to paint you know painting cars and making plastics is, is what most of the colors are actually produced for and then the art artists say oh these are nice let's do it <laughs> and then the um, car industry loses interest and they stop making them which is what happened to quinacridone gold anyway so what happens is um, the quinacridones share the characteristics of being very light fast tiny tiny pigments so very transparent non-granulating non um, very bright, uh, but they have limitations. So the, the colour range goes from the gold through sort of sienna colour, um, through there's a sort of a burnt scarlet colour, there's a purple, um, but there's no blues or greens. Then there's the thalo colours, you know, they are thalo blue, thalo green, thalo turquoise. Um, they, they share certain characteristics as well, but they just, so thalo green, yellow shade, which is PG36, is the yellowish green. Um, so very kind of a, um, um, what's it called? Uh, emerald green, <laughs> emerald green colour. And then there's the, the the blue shade, which is the PG7, which is a bit more blue. And then there's a, um, a turquoise version, which is PB16. And then there's the various phthalo blues, which are the PB15 point whatever. So that sort of range of colours. And they share the same sort of characteristics. They're very staining, they're very powerful, they're non-granulating. Um, and they're all very light fast. The perilines, there's a, a perilene green, there's a perilene maroon, a perilene red. Um, the only ones I can think of immediately. I love yeah. perilines. Yeah, they'll share certain characteristics. I think it's the perilene scarlet. Um, the pyrals share characteristics. I love the pyrals, you know, pyral orange, pyral red, pyral scarlet, pyral. You know, they're, they're very, very, they're, they're not quite as transparent, but they're really bright and vibrant. So yes, each of those sorts of colours, it's, it's, it's the chemical. And I think it's helpful. Mm. Well, it might be confusing and some of the names are so long that you just kind of, ah, you know, where do we even go with this? But I reckon it's so important to know what you're painting with. And it, and it drives mm. me mad to come across a colour like, um, you know, sky blue. You know, what's mm. that? So while it takes a little bit of getting used to, I think it's very helpful if it is called phthalo blue or pyrrole mm -hmm. red or monacridone rose or whatever because then you do know what it is you're dealing with and just the name helps you to understand the pigment. I know there are some instructors who don't like that but I think it's so helpful um, because yes yeah, so it's, it's important what we paint with it really it really is important you want to know that they're light fast you want to know that they're how they're going to behave and that's all based on the pigment. Ah, oh, so interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to know your thoughts about finding colours in nature. So when I went through this uh, magical adventure of ex exploring colours, I joined your class, I found other resources. I started this challenge for myself and some people on Instagram, which uh, was to go around the colour wheel and find something in nature and paint it. And so we did all the colours and then we did earth colours and we did uh, a couple of um, complementary exercises and it was so fun. But one thing I noticed was that some colours are easier to find in nature and I found that cool blue was really hard to find and I found it eventually on the eye of a blue-faced honey eater. Wow. And I found like warm red really hard to find. Eventually I found it um, on a little cluster of mushrooms that was on a tree trunk. And I wonder if you found that, that some colours are really common and some colours are hard to find. What an interesting challenge. That sounds lovely. Um, there is a book that exactly goes through all that. Ooh. It's called Nature's Palette. It's only just been published. It, it's called A Colour Reference System from the Natural World. It goes through all of the sort of systems of colour the old systems of colour and breaks them all down um, and then it goes through and tries to find them in the natural world. So, so yes, yeah, some things are harder to find than others. I find that there's a lot of really unusual colours in, in rocks and stones um, and shells and fish. Uh, fish you can find just about any, any colour and birds. Uh, but I know what you mean. There's, there's some colours that I use over and over again. I've just been creating a book which is called Watercolour Triads and originally I set it up just to be the triad 
and then painting a chart to show all the tertiary colors you can make so it ties in my other book and then I thought oh well I'll put some examples in where I've actually worked with that tribe but when I look through my work you know I can see so many that I work with an earth tribe or a um, or a much more limited one but when I actually start to look for ones where I've used a red and so on because I do a lot of landscape a lot of urban sketching those sorts of things it can be harder to find things like a really really bright orange I mean obviously there's an orange but in in America you've got all these fabulous gourds you know that come out in in the the whole the whole oh, pumpkin yeah. season you get the pumpkins and the gourds and the and these incredible examples of bright oranges and perylene greens and stunning colors um i just love being in in canada or the us and around you know around halloween because that's when these were available they're, they're colors we just don't see in here it's it's really interesting um, wow. so yeah sometimes it takes some finding but it's uh it just sounds like a lovely thing to do it's a challenge yeah. <laughs> yes in my sketching course i do a lot of work with um mixing opposites so we won't go right round and we create a color wheel and, and so we have to come up with a subject that mixes, for example, a, a mixed turquoise with a scarlet red, you know, with mm. and then, you know, looking at all the colours it creates and then painting something that's in those colours. And so a lot of fruit and vegetables will fit into these sorts of themes, you know, tomatoes and, and all the beautiful berry fruits and cherries and so on. But it's, um, it's, it's a lovely challenge. I think it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I learned from you, which I love from your course, I love that when you're exploring a mix, you don't make it necessarily very methodical from every shade from one side to the other. You just encourage a random mixture. And eventually when you've covered the whole page with random mixtures, you get a really good sense of what these two colors can do, but it's not this boring methodical thing of going from every shade across the page I don't know if I'm describing that well <laughs> yes so there's if for those who are familiar with um Wilcox's work you know blue and green don't make sorry blue and yellow don't make green um he did a whole series of books where he um he mixed very methodically so if he took a a, a blue and a red on the top line they would be mixed you know a tiny bit of blue added to the red tiny bit more 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 until you end up with an equal mix in the middle and yes. watered down watered down watered down I think up to five stages it takes a huge amount of space as well as a huge amount of time to do that. And in the end, what's the point? You still don't know exactly how much of any colour you've put in. It's not as though, I mean, I suppose if you were going to be even more methodical than he is, in fact, perhaps he did this, but if you were to make, um, to, to measure a certain amount of paint and a certain number of drops of water, and then a certain amount of paint and a certain number of drops of water and add one yes, drop exactly. and one drop. If you were going to do all that, then you could replicate the exact colour by re repeating that. But that's not painting as far as I'm concerned. That's science. And, um, <laughs> and so what I decided, because I, I did initially, you know, years ago, I did actually have my students do these more methodical sort of charts, but most of them didn't want to finish them. You know, it's, mm. it takes a certain type of person to want to do that. Um, and I've done them, so I know. Um, and I actually, I found it fascinating to do. But when I was teaching, I thought, no, there's got to be a better way. And so one of the reasons that we do it that way is because the problem with going from, you know, the, the say the blue to the, to the red, all in the one strength, is then, well, what happens when you add more water? Yes. And then you start adding more space. So by doing it randomly, just add a little bit of colour, add a bit of water, add a bit of the other colour, add a bit more water not only do you fit a lot into a very, very small space, you also see combinations next to each other that you might not realise otherwise. Mm. You might see that bluish purple at one point and then a very, very soft pinky purple and then another bluey light one. And you sort of think, oh, that could be a painting. Whereas when it's just going one to the other, you know, it's just a gradation. It's, it's sort of, it doesn't engage, I think, our artistic brain to the same extent. Yes, it's think, not as alive. Yeah, the randomness just makes you see possibilities. Sometimes it means you don't quite necessarily get as dark as you might or you might, you, you sort of make each one different and then you might go back and think, oh, I haven't got one that's got a lot of blue and only a tiny bit. I better add that in, just go over the top and if any of yeah. them are, uh, actually ended up the same, well, then you just cover one over. But I found that that way you, you can do it faster, you can fit more mixes on the page, which is better for your own reference. But it's also far more enjoyable. So 
yeah, there's a lot of reasons for doing it. Um, and they look so beautiful all together, I find. The, <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. The pages. But having done it both ways, I mean, my first book shows, you know, the very methodical charts and then the second one goes through with that random, very deliberately random. Um, and the third book I've gone a little bit of both. So <laughs> I've done the three colour mixes and the first the first line is tertiary green. So they're all three pigment greens and then three pigment orangey yellows and then three pigment purples and three pigment greys. So it, they're, they're deliberately random but within a family. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and each of those is really, it's worth exploring. But I think that those the way to do colour charts really is you've got to do them and to do them they've got to be fun. <laughs> And I think making them fun, make them random. It just it just feels more creative and more. What happens if I like? Yes, yes, oh, exactly. Oh no, that's wrong. You know, it's, it's so hard to get them perfect if you go the other way. Whereas it's so easy if you're just trying to make them all different. And I like to try and make things easy. You're so right, and they're so joyful, and they're so wonderful to look back on. They they just bring me a lot of joy. Just those charts that I've created in your class hmm. bring a lot of joy just looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> and the, another amazing thing that I learned from you from your classes is this idea of thinking about because water control can be a big issue in watercolor and especially for beginners they can add too much or too little but I love the way you think you teach us to think about the different level of water as cream the texture of cream milk coffee tea and wheat tea this has helped me so much and I'd love for you to just talk a little about that mm. yes I had to come up with some way of explaining it and I think that you know we're all familiar with beverages I know that I know if I've heard somewhere of someone talking about milk or honey and, and there's it's not as though I I devised the whole idea of, of an analogy but for me I really wanted to be able to show that this is something you can understand so so to explain it, I, I, I encourage people to either start with the, the tube colour, a little blob of the tube colour, or to start with just clean water. And in fact, going both directions is really helpful. But if we started with the, the, the tube, a little blob of tube colour and add just enough water so that it starts to move, you know, that's, that's our cream consistency. The point is, it's watercolour. So you don't just use it straight from the tube. That's acrylic and oil. That different thing <laughs> together. Watercolour is always flat. If it's got any sort of texture on the page, you've actually got a three-dimensional watercolour. It's not watercolour anymore because it'll start to do this ugly thing called bronzing. So we have to add enough water to make it just start to move. And I, if you think of it like pouring cream, um, so it will actually move on the palette. And I encourage people to actually pick the palette up and actually make sure that it's starting to move. Um, and then we add a bit of water to that. Now, a bit, it might be a brushful, it might be two brushfuls. It depends how much paint you've started with. So once again, we can't be too mathematical. But you add enough water so that it starts to move a little bit more freely, but it's not like water. So it's more like milk, so that it will run, but a little bit slower. Um, so that's our next one. So we've got the, the cream is, is, a, is what you would do probably last in a painting. It's the kind of the jewels or the little additions you might add at the very end. The milky one is going to be strong, but not as strong as the cream. And then if we add water again, so that it actually starts to move um, freely like water, but it's going to be strong colored water. So that's the coffee. And I describe it as being like, if, if you had black coffee in a glass, you would be able to see that it's all fluid. You'd see it as a, as a, as a liquid, but you couldn't quite see your hand through it. So it's yes. opaque sort of consistency so it's very strong but it's um but it still is watery so you move it on the palette like water then we dilute that again and by now you might be adding two brushfuls of water as well as I say quantities it's hard to say it depends what you start mm. um so then it becomes like a tea so once again it's like a um, if you had a glass of black tea you could start to see your hand through it so it's going to be a bit more transparent so it's quite strong colored but it's still liquid and then the weak tea well I often think about you know if you're in America and you ask for tea they'll bring um, a cup of lukewarm water, well, maybe warm water, and a tea bag on the side, and you dunk it in there. And for all you try, you can never quite get it to be more than just, you know, weak tea. So that's that's our weak tea. It's just slightly <laughs> coloured water. And and practising doing this kind of five steps, obviously then you've got the sixth is the white paper. It's really, really helpful. And obviously you can have others in between. But I think thinking in terms of the five tones plus white is enough for most people. Um, and I think in Chinese brush painting, they tend to talk about seven tones. 
Okay. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's genuine enough. And obviously there's, there's stages in between. Sometimes I talk about, well, we really want it to be like a cafe latte. So it's somewhere between <laughs> the coffee and the milk. But I think it, it really helps to, to practice those sorts of um, techniques. And as I say, if you start with the, the blob of paint or if you're working with pans of water, you know, really thick, really kind of building up a thick, creamy mixture and work your way down and then do the opposite. Start with the water and gradually tint it up until you get up to the cream. Both of those are incredibly helpful. And thinking about it and labelling it and, and, you know, knowing what you're, you're aiming for and getting there, it really helps with building up the vocabulary of being able to talk about watercolour. Yes, I found that so helpful. And I felt like for years my watercolours were much too pale and maybe I was just because as a beginner, I guess you're tentative uh, or maybe I wasn't layering as much as I could or do now, but this this whole thing of water control and knowing how much water is in the mix and how much water you need, it was really, really helpful and it changed the, the punch of my mm. paintings. Mm. Well, I think it helps that you know what's possible because I think that some people think watercolour is wishy-washy. They, they, they think that it's watery. And it really, really is vibrant and bright and powerful. So it, it doesn't have to be wishy-washy at all. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And I do like to think in terms of your painting um, of, of trying to aim for a full tonal range from white yes. up to, if not black, certainly very close. So that if you're thinking about, you know, range from, from one to ten, um, you've got at least up to nine to get the strength. And that's where, you know, James Gray or these mixed blacks come into play or very, very dark greens. But, you know, you need some darks to set off your lights and give the whole thing an interest. Sort of like a, a black and white photo looks best if it's got some blacks and some whites and everything in between. I think watercolour is the same for any painting. You really want to have dramatic darks somewhere and that lovely contrast between the darks and the lights. Let's talk about Jane's Grey. You've mentioned it a few times. It's one of my absolute favourite colours. I use it almost every time I paint. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. Okay, so Jane's Grey is a mixture of ultramarine and burnt sienna. It's an almost identical mix. Um, there's just slightly more ultramarine. So it makes a neutralised grey um, or near neutralised grey. I do it just on the blue side because... It's sort of the colours of, of shadow, um, but it just it just works better if it's just slightly on the blue side. I've tried it in many different brands, um, but it's it's best done with with Daniel Smith. So the um, the Daniel Smith Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna. Um, now they they then made it as a as a mix, so it's one of their signature series colours. So it's available, which is fantastic, and they matched it perfectly. So I don't have to bake it anymore. I used to make <laughs> um, I'd use two full tubes of ultramarine mm -hmm. and just about two full tubes of of burnt sienna, and I'd mix it in a in a pot. You know, stir it up really really well, test it, get it right, pour it into a tube. You know, oh, wow. great big empty tubes. It was quite a pain to make it. But I don't have to anymore because they they've made it, which is fantastic. Where it's different from any of the greys that were on the market before is that generally it's compared with Payne's grey. And the name was a bit of a pun on that. I kind of thought yes. it was fun because Payne's Yeah, grey. I love that. <laughs> so the story of Payne's grey is interesting. So originally William Payne um, had Windsor and Newton make um, a grey. And his recipe was, as far as I can find out, yellow ochre, so a yellow, crimson lake, and iron blue, which is like Prussian blue. So it was a yellow, red, and a blue mixed up to a certain recipe to make a, a grey, which I believe was slightly on the blue side. Um, these days, there isn't a single company that makes Payne's grey according to Payne's recipe, which I think is tragic mm. because a grey made out of a yellow, a red, and a blue would actually be really interesting. I make them a lot. They're gorgeous. But, you know, they don't exist. They're all made, made now out of black, black. usually mm. halo blue, sometimes a little bit of quinacridone rose or violet and so black pigments just suck up all the all the light and absorb all the light and don't reflect anything back so they just create really dull cold passages and Payne's grey varies among the different um, different brands but they're all staining they're all powerful and they're all dull and so Jane's grey was very different it's liftable it's granulating but it's not staining and it's not going to create, you know, dead passages um, where the light isn't reflected. So really quite radical in that sense. 
Um, so it's been um, it's been really lovely to to have it available because it's I mean I use it as a shadow color I use it as a neutral tint I use it as a, I mean yeah I, I don't think I do anything where I don't use it it's just so useful um, and while of course you can mix it on the palette you can you know mix your gray and the blue and mix them together but when you do it um, in the palette they might separate more which can be lovely but what I wanted because I often use it for skies I didn't really want to have burnt sienna in the sky. Because I don't see that, and so having it as a premix that's um, that's already made, that's ready to go, it's just incredibly useful. And it started off, I mean, years ago when I would make it, I'd literally make it for my students because I'd often make up their palettes, and I and I I put this color in there. And originally I called it Bist, which I understood to be a French word for a grey, but then I realised it's also a brown. Oh, that's confusing. So then I started calling it Jane's Grey because then I knew what I was talking about because I had to call it something because I label it. <laughs> Um, so that's where it came from. I love that. Yeah. So then, it, and that's stuck. So that's that's what it is. I use it often for the sky, and I love that you can just push it mm. a little bit by adding um, extra ultramarine to make it a cool sort of shadow on the clouds, and can add a little bit more burnt sienna to make a warmer cloud shadow if if your sky is warm. Mm. It's super super versatile. Yeah. One of my favourites. <laughs> it's a bit like working with something like a sap green. It gives you a starting green that you can then add a bit more yellow, add a bit more blue, but you know where you start. And, you know, I talked about, you know, they do use convenience colours. And I think when you're doing nat nature studies, it can be helpful to have a ready-made colour because yes. then your whole plant is going to look connected. Whereas if you kept on mixing and mixing and mixing from the, 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 the blue and the, the yellow, you might end up not looking as though it's all the same plant. So I think sometimes starting with a, um, a convenience colour or making enough of a convenience sort of colour to start with is really important. So, yes, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a mixed colour, but I just find it so useful and it behaves slightly differently. But sometimes there might be a time when you want your shadow to be a little bit, you know, actually sort of mingle in the, in the paint, in, I mean, on the paper, and that's mm -hmm. fine too. So in that case, you might dampen the paper and put some ultramarine and put some burnt sienna and let them just mingle on the paper and then you have a, a different sort of lively shadow but uh, it's nice to have the choice to do it either way <laughs> yes so you have this amazing website you have two things you have your website which has is full of information and then you have your blog which is an incredible resource for anyone who wants to explore color and I'm going to link in the show notes for this episode to you to both of those places I'd love to talk about this incredibly ambitious project you have which you've done a huge chunk of which is to paint out every available professional color in the world <laughs> <laughs> tell me about this is incredibly ambitious but you have just achieved so much already yes it's something I started my website in um, 2012 I think I was I launched it and it was one of the things I wanted to do because I'd, I'd done all these colour charts and and they were they were sitting on my shelf and I thought there there's a huge amount of work in these and I wanted to put them somewhere where I could share them. So one of the first things I think I put was the, the watercolour mixing charts, which is a one big section in the resources part of my website. Um, but another thing I wanted to do is because I've I've you know I had I had managed to test every Daniel Smith watercolour. And I managed to test a bunch of others and so on. And I know that it wasn't very easy to do. Um, so, it, you know, it took a long time and a lot of, you know, I've, I've been working with Daniel Smith Watercolour since 1995 and it took me until, oh, I've forgotten exactly when, but I had a whole book and I was painting out every single one. And then I thought, well, I should do a little swatch of those. So I just started with thinking, well, you know, then there's all the schwinky and then there's all this and this and this. And so I thought, well, how about I just try and, you know, get hold of them all. And it's been incredible because when I put it up there, I've had I've had people contact me from all over the world and say, oh, I noticed that you don't have this, this and this. Can I send it to you? And I'll say, yes, absolutely. So I have had a huge amount of help from people and, and manufacturers as well sending me samples so that I can put them up there. Um, the problem is that it can be a bit clunky looking through them. That's, that's the problem with it. Um, I, I actually feel as I almost need to reload them all but then I started doing the blog part. So as I was able, I would go through and, and you know, make a card for every single colour in a range and then paint those out um, so that then you could see the whole range. So the idea is you can either see them as a range, so all of the Winsor & Newton or all of the Daniel Smith, all of the Schwinky or whatever, um, but then you can also compare on my website by pigment. 
Yes. And it's, it is ongoing um, because I've been creating courses and books. I haven't updated it for a while because there's actually probably another 500 samples to put up there. Um, and it takes it takes so long. Oh, Every yeah. single one, I, I scan them. <laughs> and I don't have really great software for colour, you know, digitising colour and those sorts of things. I should, but I just don't. And so I try and get it as best I can, either photographing it or scanning it. But then, you know, then I crop it and I load it up and every single colour load up and then write the title and so on. So it takes a long time. And if I try, I can't move it from one gallery to another. If I need to change the way I'm setting it up, I actually have to reload it and so on. So okay. it's quite time consuming, but um, it's one of those things that um, I actually think it's very helpful, but it's um, because it's really interesting to be able to see a pigment in all the different brands. So I have in my you know to do some time is to actually find a slightly better way to display them and it might have to spread over more pages because it's just so many you know there's there's thousands of them and now there's lots of people coming out with handmade pigments aren't yeah. there? what are your thoughts on handmade pigments do you use them yeah I've, I've tried a couple of them and some of them are lovely the, the problem is it can be hard for people to get hold of them so yes I have I have shown a couple of the handmade um, watercolors and you know, but sometimes they'll they'll have they'll have a restock and then they're sold and then you can't get hold of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I sort of concentrating more on the ones where you can get hold of them. But um, but I have done a blog post on a couple of people who've done this because then you can see if they're prepared to say where they got the pigment, then other hand makers may want to do them themselves. I mean, I, making watercolor is really fun. Um, I only did it myself in the last year, and Ooh. it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Not that I want to make my own range or not that I even want to paint with them because I am very happy with using what I'm using. But I just thought, I've been playing around with watercolour for 40 years. I really probably ought to <laughs> as well. Um, and it was really fun. But um, what it gives you is the ability to work with a, a very limited amount of, of pigment. And it started for me because I was given these beautiful pigments from, from Provence in France. And I think there were 10 colours or whatever. And they were sitting, I just had small amounts and eventually I just thought, I've got to turn these. I tried just adding water and adding gum arabic and making something. You've actually got to get the muller out and you know, put okay. it all down. And it's actually really fun. So I made <laughs> this earth set of, of handmade watercolours. Um, I mean, it's beautiful to watch. It's lovely to do. Uh, and I really admire the kind of colours that a lot of people are making. Uh, so I think that, you know, those of you who, who want to actually do the wait for the, the restocking, all those sorts of things, you can get some amazing colours. So I've got another set from another company coming shortly. So I will be up uh, putting up another one of a, another hand, quite large handmade range. Um, so look, if people are happy to send me things, I'll always add them in. But I can't contact everyone and ask. Yes, it's just it's too many. So I've really tried to stock the major brands and try and update those because that's what most people get hold of. Because uh, then it's a bit more helpful. But then if, uh, if a brand does a you know does a complete. Know, changes everything around or drops a color as a color I, I can't always I don't always know <laughs> yes uh, this project though is so helpful I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to your blog and your website and just trawled through <laughs> pages and pages of color it's just such an incredible reference thank you Jane, it's been just such a treat to talk to you. You're one of my huge influences and it's it feels very exciting to talk to you and to dig into some of this super fun colour stuff. So thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. Lovely to talk to you, Bethany. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Jane. I felt so happy to have the opportunity to chat with someone who has been such a big influence on my own journey. Jane's class, Mastering Watercolour, was where I learned a huge amount about colour mixing and watercolour skills and I definitely recommend it for anyone who's interested in going further with their watercolour explorations. I'd like to say a big thank you to those of you who have been leaving reviews of the show on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere. It warms me up from the inside to read your beautiful and supportive words and it also helps Journaling with Nature podcast be found by others who also love nature and nature journaling. So go ahead and leave a review if you're enjoying the show and you haven't done so yet. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.